Okay, good morning. good morning. I hope you all had a chance to partake of the goodies in the hallway. We're celebrating, not really, but we're saying goodbye to Linda and Dave, and they'll be here for two more weeks. But if you have a chance, stop by the church office and let them know you'll miss them. Also, in filling out your Connect cards, because we're going to have a new person in Linda's job, could you be really attentive to how you fill it out? Print if you remember how. Just to make it easy for our new person to get, to get the drift of what all those cards are for. We do read all of those. Jerry prays over them every week. Anything you want to share with him, you can share on that card. That's the importance of the Connect card. It was in your bulletin today. Other information on the back of your bulletin. In the middle is a list of the Holy Week services. So maybe you want to put this on your refrigerator when you get home so you don't miss something during Holy Week. That tends to get to be a really busy week. And maybe you'll have company. And we'll hope we have company in church for one of those services. So there will be an Easter egg hunt if you've got little ones coming or maybe middle-sized ones, bring them along. Um, also, there's information about our church scholarship applications. Those have a May 1st deadline. So if you know somebody that could use some help and has been active in our church, make sure they get those filled out. Okay, anything else I'm supposed to mention? Oh, I do have to say thank you very much to the um, men, ma mainly Bob, but he fixed food for the thank you banquet for the food pantry volunteers yesterday, and it was wonderful. It was very tasty. Also, thank you to all those who brought goodies for today's festival food sharing. Um, one more opportunity is pasta for Paxton, and there are tickets in the breezeway for that. Um, Paxton's one of our church members, and you can read about that on the back of your bulletin. Okay, with all of that in mind, if you'll stand, we'll join together in the call to worship. O oh God, we come before you in humility. We trust that you and you alone can forgive forever. By your mercy, wipe away every transgression. O Lord, restore us, deliver us, and recreate us. Amen. Taylor, you want to come down? Come on down, my goodness gracious. All right, and anybody else who feels like a children's chat, just come on down. Ugh. One caveat, it's easier to get down than it is to get up. Okay. Hello, it's good to see you. How? Oh, oh, are you okay? You, do, you blew out your flip-flop, stepped on a pop-top? You know, this is just the morning at the first service. One of the kids knocked this over, and the, the vase fell on my head and shattered. It's just the morning. Well, hello. How do you feel? You feel okay? Yeah, I'm so glad. You know, we're going to talk about three, well five very important words. Can you count them? Yeah? I do see her. Yeah? Is she, is she somebody important to you? Yes. Really? Yeah, does she know how important you are to her? Yeah, I thought she did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So here's, here's, here's two very important words. You want to learn them? I'm sorry. Can you say that? I'm sorry. Very good. And when somebody says, I'm sorry, you're supposed to say three very important words back. I forgive you. You want to practice? I'm going to say to you, I'm sorry. And then I forgive you. All right. You know what I've got to remind us? That when God forgives us, you know, his, it says, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that's like to infinity and beyond. When God forgives us, our sin is totally forgotten. So when God says, I forgive you, it's forever and always. 
it's sort of like the best eraser in the world. Do you know what an eraser is? What does an eraser do? It erases. Oh, it was a trick question. Oh, look what I've got. You know, can you help me pass some of these out? Yeah. Are you willing to do this? Yeah. Keep one for yourself. But these have that psalm that we quoted right here as far as the east is from the west. And it reminds us that when we ask God to forgive us, we say, I'm sorry. He says, I forgive you forever and ever and ever. Are you ready to pray? Yeah. All right. Dear God, thank you so much for forgiving forever. Amen. Okay. Do you want to take this and pass them out? Okay. If you'd like an eraser to remind you that your sins that are forgiven forever, make sure you see Taylor. All right? And if I can get the choir to come on up, once they get their forever forgiven eraser, <laughs> this may take the entire song. So enjoy. Enjoy. This is how we train our ushers, by the way. <laughs> Please stand and join us. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, not save am I. Love lifted me. may have lifted you, but have a seat.
Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Father, may we always remember as we approach Easter what your son's resurrection means for us. Forgiveness, freedom, and the ability to walk with you through this fallen world into eternity. We thank you for your love, your forgiveness, your grace, and your answer to prayers. We lift up all those on our prayer list and ask that you give them comfort, healing, and assurance that you are with them. We lift up all of those affected by the tornadoes that hit on this Friday, last Friday night. We ask for your blessings upon Linda and Dave as they move to a new place, and we pray that you will give them a long and blessed life. We pray for Pastor Jerry and that you will give him comfort and relief and give your power of healing to those who minister to his needs. Lord, thank you for being beside each of us at all times. Give us the faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, <coughs> and the will to put it into practice. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with your spirit. And may we be full of grace, joy, and peace because of your presence within us. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Please rise and we'll sing a, med a medley together.
Amen. And you may be seated. All right. So what's so amazing about grace? It's free, but it costs Christ everything, right? So uh, it's free, but it's not cheap, right? So what's so amazing about grace? Jesus is what's amazing about grace. Um, so I hope you had a chance to enjoy the soiree out in the uh, hallway uh, Staff Parish put on for Jim and Lin- or Jim, uh, for <laughs> Linda and Dave as they prepare. They're not leaving yet. They'll be here through Easter. But as they prepare to move down to be near their grandkids. Does that make sense? It does, doesn't it? But what I've discovered is if you need li- move to be near kids or grandkids, what do they do once you get there? They move. They move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, babysit would be all right. I'm all over that. <laughs> um, let's see. So I do want to add my welcome to the welcome you've already received, whether you're online or in person. We're just glad you're here. Um, we're going to talk about something today that healthy churches just intuitively get. That's the idea that we wrestled with during the 10-week series on uh, uh, the brother of Jesus' book uh, by his name, which is James. Uh, The primary idea in James is this. uh, Faith is personal, but it can't be private. That's true for individual Christians. It's definitely true for Christian churches. One of the measures back in the church growth movement days of an effective church was this. You'd ask your community, not your church members, but you'd ask your communities. First, you'd ask them, do you know where Roseland United Methodist Church is? And if they said, what? (laughs) Then we weren't talking to our neighbors. It didn't matter how much we enjoyed what happened on Sunday morning. The truth is, uh, we just weren't communicating effectively to the people we're called to serve. And, And the second axiom inside of the church growth movement was this. You'd ask the question, again, of your neighbors, not church members, If this church closed today, what would you miss? No, church members would miss everyone, but that's not a question for church members. What would the neighbors miss if this church closed? What do you think? They'd miss the food pantry, right? (laughs) Thrift store, right? (laughs) Amen, sausage and gravy. Uh, A lot of them would miss our preschool. It's the largest VPK program in this county. So there are a lot of people who would miss us. Uh, But the question is, uh, what is our church really known for? And uh, it doesn't matter how warm and fuzzy we think it is inside the walls. It's whether or not those walls become transparent and become a doorway for other people to find faith in Jesus Christ. So a church that just tells people what's wrong with their lives is pretty much, according to Jesus' brother James, useless. That idea comes from James 2.26. Read it with me. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So if we're not working for Christ in our community, then we're not about anything but a dead faith. Not my words, brother of Jesus Take it up with him, okay? Uh, There's a Christian 12-step ministry called Celebrate Recovery. Anybody ever heard of Celebrate Recovery? You know, in the first service, I was amazed at how many people have. Yeah, and that's great. You know, I've encouraged Celebrate Recovery in every setting we've been at. Uh, In Indiana, we weren't able to get it going. And we've got two great uh, 12-step groups here, AA, uh, and hopefully we'll get an Al-Anon going for those families that Uh, It's also a family struggle, not just an individual struggle. The nice thing about Celebrate Recovery, though, is the higher power has a name. Guess what his name is? Jesus Christ. Okay? So I'm not looking to push AA to the curb. Not that at all. I want to encourage and grow those. But the truth is healing, deeper healing, more sustainable healing, is found in the power of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. So a few years ago, we served at church Uh, up north here, and when I came in, they had a Celebrate Recovery program, but the truth is it had fallen on hard times. Um, The the leader who'd taken it over recently uh, was just discouraged, and it showed up in the ministry. It got down to less than maybe a dozen people showing up. And so he asked if I could come to the group and kind of offer him some suggestions, because like I say, I've, you know, been to the training George A. Savito's church does over in Cape Coral, largest 
uh, Celebrate Recovery program in Southeast United States. And uh, we've been involved in those programs in other churches. So I agreed to go. And so I went a few times and, and you know, I would cut out after the meal and just kind of get to know people, trying to introduce myself as a pastor of the church where they met, uh, trying to make them know that I wasn't very judgmental, that I wasn't one of those pastors that's really more of a jerk than Jesus, you know what I mean? And uh, so they began to trust me. And so uh, once we had that bond created, then um, I agreed to do one of the talks. Every night there's a talk. Uh, it's got at least an outline. I, I can follow a nightline pretty good as long as Jesus is in it. And so I r did the thing, and, and I actually did it a couple of times. But this first night, I gave the little talk after the meal together. We always break bread and do a meal. And then you break off into small groups, uh, groups for men, groups for women, because, you know, when we're together, we just always have masks on. We can't be truly honest. So I went with a men's group, obviously, and... Uh, we sat in a circle and uh, around tables, and uh, one guy began to share his check-in. He says, last, uh, last week, um, uh, I drove by a strip club, and I turned in. And then uh, a strange thing happened. Three or four hands around the table went up, just like that. And then the next guy checked in. He says, last week, I bought and drank a fifth of vodka on my way home. Two or three hands around the table went up. And as I listened to each of the guys check in, hands would go up. Um, and then I figured out the group dynamic. Those that had a similar struggle the week before were the ones who raised their hand. And here's the basic premise. You don't struggle alone. Can you say that with me? You don't struggle alone. And then one guy shared how he'd slept with a co-worker that he'd slept with before, and he'd swore he'd never do it again. Not a hand went up. And then he said these words. I felt like God could never love me again. And every hand in the room went up. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says this. Read it with me, would you? Two are better than one, because if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Here's what I want you to get from today's message. Don't struggle alone. And it doesn't matter what that struggle is. Don't struggle alone. This church is not to be a place where people point fingers. Or to be a people who raise hands. I've struggled with that. Here, here's how Jesus got me through. I've struggled with something like that. It was in my small group that I found help. I struggled with that, but it was in my daily quiet time, my devotion when I prayed, and all that would come out of my heart was, God, I need you now. We're all cracked pots. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a crack. Don't call them a crack pot. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a crack pot. But grace is enough. Watch this clip with me, would you? Have mercy on me, O oh God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you alone I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Behold, you delight in the truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. 
Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart that you, God, will not despise. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of putting broken pottery back together and then highlighting the flaws with gold just as you saw. And my friends, that's what grace is supposed to do. The Holy Spirit living in Christians, the Holy Spirit living in community together called the church is supposed to help put people back together and you become a priceless piece of art, a masterpiece, the Bible says, created and being recreated in God's own image. That's what grace does. It heals our imperfections and makes us stronger in Christ individually and together. And a church that doesn't have a celebrate recovery-like ministry at its heart is always a tenuous proposition. Pretty soon, we're pointing fingers instead of raising hands. Pretty soon, those people aren't welcome, but only people like me. And the truth is, people like you and me are probably the worst of the cracked pots. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, we discover what grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, is truly all about. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He said, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What God has done on Calvary's cross through the blood of Jesus Christ can repair anything that's broken in you, broken in your family, broken in your marriage, broken between you and your children, any aspect of what it means to be you, every place where the pottery has been shattered, it can be brought back together. But it doesn't stop there. He says, my power is made perfect in your what? So why do we hide our weakness? Because of pointing fingers instead of raised hands. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my what? Weaknesses. Are you ready? Do you really feel that this is a safe enough place for you to boast about your weaknesses? To come clean about what you drank or ate or who you slept with? About the gossip or about the anger? Or about the prejudice or the pride? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses in a fully functioning church of Jesus Christ. That is the normal, not the exception. And the reason is so that Christ's power, what? Read it with me. May rest on me. Are you restless? Is your spirit wounded? Is your soul tired and fatigued? Maybe you need to look at this passage a little deeper and a little longer than what we can afford today. You're always welcome to go back and explore these scriptures together, maybe as a couple, maybe in your private time with the Lord. Put my weaknesses on display to tell you what I know to be wrong with me. That's not what we want to do. We want to pretend our marriage, our kids, our health are all just perfect. How's it going with you? What's the response? Fine, just fine. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> We're called to celebrate God's grace. God's redeeming, renewing work in our lives. Do you remember King David? Good guy or bad guy? 
There you go. He is a guy, right? Right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want to rehearse this because maybe online or maybe in this room to somebody who doesn't really know this part of his story, even though it's well known, you'll know it. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. And while he was taking a walk on the roof, which isn't uncommon because in the cool of the night, you could be out there and you can enjoy it. From the roof, he saw a woman doing what? She was naked. Okay. <laughs> Do you know the difference between naked and naked? Naked means you don't have clothes on. Naked means you got clothes off for a reason. Okay. So, but she was naked. You don't bathe in your clothes. And so this isn't uncommon. I mean, the truth is, you bathed on your roof, from, safe from prying eyes from neighbors' windows and neighbors' courtyards. Uh, you're on the roof. Uh, your water would warm up naturally from the sun of the day, so when the cool of the night came, you could have a beautiful warm bath, long, even if you were in a small town or a town that didn't have all the advantages of being a Roman Empire city. But now King David's palace was higher than every other roof. In today's parlance, he got all the channels, okay? Yeah, yeah, so... He spies this woman bathing, and the woman is very beautiful, and so David sent someone to find out about her. It's good to be the king. You got people to do your bidding. So David brings Bathsheba to the palace. Her husband Uriah is away at war. Uh, They have sex, and she returns home, but discovers she's what? Don't you hate it when the worst laid plans of mice and men are exposed? So David decided to bring her husband Uriah home from the war, got him drunk, and sent him home to sleep with his wife so that everyone would think, what? Yeah, he was, it was his child. We go to great lengths to hide our sin, don't we? But you're a crackpot, and so am I. And David is a pile of shard, uh, shards here. He really is. But, but Uriah was a man of honor. And he refused And David was, frankly, confused. David would and had developed honor, uh, but in this moment, he was thinking with the wrong head. David was being an animal and using power, the power of his position, to rape another man's wife. So Uriah wouldn't play along with this idea that he, David would be able to pretend it's his son. So Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel are staying in tents. Why? Because they were at war. So how could I go to my house and eat and drink and make merry, make love to my wife? As surely as you live, righteous King David, I will never do such a thing. There's a principle in leadership that some people in leadership, both in the church and in the government and in businesses, need to remember that's on display here. When does a general eat? After the men eat. When does a general sleep? After the troops are quartered for the night. You see, righteous leadership leads people. It doesn't play to your own power and prestige, and David has forgotten that. And so David is in a place where Saul was just before Saul was replaced by David. You and I get in those positions a lot, no matter whether your leadership is in your home or your club or your PTO or maybe your HOA or in your church or your company. or where. Leadership is temporary. Do you know what they call it if you think you're leading and you turn around and nobody's following you? You know what they call that? A nice walk. <laughs> you lead people's lives. And if you're leading simply from power or prestige, that is a very tenuous form of leadership. Leadership is always about integrity, and right here in this story, Uriah has it, and King David does not. King David does everything in his power to try to manipulate the situation to cover up his sin, but finally, he's so frustrated that he sends Uriah back to the battlefront with a message, wouldn't you hate to carry your own death sentence and not be aware? Just listen, David wrote a letter to Joab, the general in the field, and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, and then withdraw so that he will be what? Struck down and die. 
So David went from lust in his heart to rape in his bedroom to now murder on the battlefield. And yet he is and was a man after God's own heart. So don't think that by pointing fingers at King David, don't think that well, all men are dogs. Don't think that all women are lambs for slaughter. Don't think that that is the point of this story. It is not. Yes, David had committed all kinds of sin. The story goes on, 2 Samuel eleven twenty six 26 through 27. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned. You need to feel how she's been used in this power play among men. And I hate that with a passion. I have a white knight syndrome. You want to get on my bad side? You want to see my dark side emerge? You be a bully to somebody who's powerless. And I'll come out of my chair. And I'll use words that you didn't think I knew. And I'll push back with every amount of force that you pushed against them. That's what Nathan did. The prophet. The one that David could have killed just as surely and as quickly as he did Uriah. David tried to hide the broken pieces of his life, what he'd done. But then his integrity begins to mount again. He could have killed her just as easily. He brings her to the palace and makes her his wife, and she bears him a son that would eventually die. And that is not my book, Punishment for the Sin. That child was innocent. That's like a blaming an aborted fetus for the actions of a man and woman. But the truth is this, what David had done, read it with me, displeased the Lord. The Bible's clear, God is not mocked. What you do in private, God sees if it's got, as if it's got a searchlight on it. And God knows. He knows not just what we've done, not, he knows what we're going to do. He, he knows not just the actions, but the feelings that drove the actions and the thoughts that we entertain to get us to that place of darkness. God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David, and he finally comes clean. And that is the point of this story. And that is my hope for each and every one of us sitting here or watching online today or sometime in the future. As we'll recognize the point is to come clean. David recognized his sin and acknowledged his brokenness. He gets to experience God's restoration in his life only because... He admitted that God was right and what he'd done was wrong. And I become angry when the church helps people continue in doing wrong and acts as if. Because God is still not mocked. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to displease the Lord any more than I have to. And when I do, I want to as quickly as possible own it. How about you? You say, God, you are right and I am wrong but we try to cover it up. You know, there's a guy that comes to the gym, the Sebastian gym. He started coming recently, and the truth is he doesn't shower very much. You know how I know? Because he uses a lot of Axe body spray. <laughs> so much so that when he's on a machine next to me, I have to stop in the middle of my set and move without trying to be mean. I just can't breathe. Several places in the Bible, it says that our prayers rise as, an, as a, a noxious stench unto the Lord. If you think you're going to pray your way out of with nice words and not confront the sin, God says, I turn a deaf ear to that kind of prayer. If you want to experience what King David experienced after raping this woman, after killing her husband, murdering her husband, and then you're going to have to do what David did. You're going to have to do what the prodigal son did. You're going to have to come to your senses and agree that you're living in a far country. You may not have changed your zip code, your street address, but the truth is you know what God's truth says and you are walking away or have walked away so far that you can no longer see what God is saying. You know, David was trying to cover it up. He was trying to impress people with his holiness, his righteousness, his power, his prestige. 
but God was not mocked. He needed to be cleansed like my friend at the gym. Just shower, for God's sakes. Save 50 bucks on Axe Body Spray, all right? David wrote a psalm about this time that you can use when you find yourself trying to justify, rationalize, or hide your own sin. This is really the heart beat of this message. It's not so much the story of David's fall. It's the story of how David came clean, how he stopped trying to cover up his sin, and how he allowed God to heal the cracks and then cover it with gold and turn it into a work of grace. Church father, St. Augustine, wrote, My sin was all the more incurable because I did not think myself a sinner. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is the one that you will not confess. And I long for you to be free from something that you've struggled with for a long time, something that you brought into this message this morning, something that you probably haven't thought about in a while because the truth is, like David, you're trying to deny it. You're trying to cover it up. You're trying to blame someone else. But we have to acknowledge our sin. Oh, we can try to minimize and rationalize it or blame it. If, if it wasn't for my spouse or the way I was raised or the world in which we live today, then I wouldn't have to give in to this appetite which God's word tells me is unhealthy. Blame is the most typical one. It comes in all kinds of forms like 57, Heinz 57 steak sauce. By the way, there weren't really 57 flavors. They just picked a number, you know. I saw it on the internet, so it has to be true, okay? <laughs> but blame, that's what Adam did right out of the gate. It's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. <laughs> and who is he really blaming? God. He's saying, it's your fault. <laughs> we still do it. We say, but God, you made me this way. We say, you're the one that didn't answer my prayers. I would have never done this if you'd just done what I wanted you to do, God. And we all say the same thing in different ways. I'm innocent. But the Bible assures us none of us are. David tried to act innocent, and we do too. It didn't work for him, and it won't work any better for you or me. Psalm 33 goes on, or 32, I should say. It says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are what? Forgiven. If you've got ick in you, if you're sick, get it out. Whose sins are covered by what? By deceit, by self-denial, by pride, by anger, by... Is that what really covers sin? What's the only thing that can cover the sin of a human being? The blood of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful you know that. It tells me I haven't ministered here a year and a half in vain. Too many Christians that don't know that. Too many churches that don't seem to believe that. You cannot make yourself righteous. You just can't. You, like me and King David, simply have to fall on the mercy of the court of heaven. So blessed are the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Wouldn't you love to have your balance in your account with God zeroed out? You know, it's even better than that. Uh, it, not to give you $50 words, you, you're not here for theology class, but uh, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. The The unending balance of righteousness that is Jesus when you come to believe in him as your Lord and Savior is imputed to your account. It'd be like you go to the ATM and you know you don't have enough to get $20 out. You put your card in and it says your balance is infinity. Wow! What kind of a vacation would you take? <laughs> the Apostle Paul is careful to tell us in most of his letters that grace isn't so you can you know, sin more so that grace will abound more. No, 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 no. You, but that's the reality. Jesus Christ, his righteousness has been imparted or imputed. I'm not going to fight you on that. But your account is not just zeroed out. Your account has an, a balance of infinity. When, when God looks at you, he sees his son if you're a believer. If you're not, God sees your sin, not his son. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whom their spirit is no deceit. So if you continue to deceive yourself, deceive your spouse, deceive your friends, deceive the world, uh, the truth is you may get away with it until the day you draw your last breath, but you never once for a moment deceived God. 
come clean. Find a place that's safe where you can be held accountable to the broken appetites that you possess, and we all possess them. And if you think you don't have broken appetites, friend, you are probably the most broken of all the pots here. Psalm 33, 5 says it this way. When I, what? Kept silent. Thank you for that. <laughs> when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. You know, even when you, in your own mind, can rationalize, pretend that your sin's not real or just isn't that big of a deal, uh, your body still keeps score. Your soul keeps score. You, you become depressed in your spirit, your body. If you are not dealing with the stress in your life, and believe me, unconfessed sin is one of the greatest uh, chronic stressors that most people face, uh, you're going to begin to have ulcers. You're going to begin to have a short temper. You're going to begin uh, to be forgetful. At least I think that's what it says. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is this. It's called conviction. For day and night, God's hand is heavy on you. God loves you so much. He will sacrifice your comfort for the development of his son's character. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. How many of you would love to get up on July 16th, and it's 92 degrees, the first thing in the morning, and you want to go out and mow the lawn? We understand what it means when it says my strength was sapped in the heat of the summer. We live in the heat of the summer almost year-round. Didn't you love the break in the weather? Wasn't that nice? Yeah. It's like in July when you open the refrigerator and just stand there for five minutes. It was like, ooh, this is what it feels like. But that's what unconfessed sin does. Satan loves it when we struggle alone. The Bible compares Satan to a hungry lion that wanders around trying to devour People who are foolish enough to leave the safety of the herd. That's how it is in Africa, not just for Christians around the globe. I mean, if the, the lion or lioness is hungry, then they look for the stray. They look for the weak one. They look for the one who's wounded, and they call them out of the herd, and then they bring them down and have lunch. Some of you have been struggling harder than you have to. And I accept part of that blame because we don't have a Celebrate Recovery type ministry here yet, but we're going to. A place where if you choose to be honest, you know, this isn't foreign to Methodism. This is in our DNA. Originally, to be in a Methodist church, to sit in a service, meant that you went to the class meeting that week. That when you walked in the door, your class leader said these words, how is it with your soul? And if you said, I'm fine, <laughs> the conversation was just beginning. I know you're struggling with alcohol. I know you're struggling with pornography. I know you're struggling with gossip. I know you're struggling with your temper. Then they'd ask the question again, how is it with your soul? This is the DNA of what it means to be a healthy church. It's not a place to go and pretend that we're all perfect. It's a place to bring your cracked pot and allow your brothers and sisters in Christ put the pieces back together, and then allow the grace of Christ to cover those cracks with the blood of Jesus, the gold that is more, uh, something that is far more precious than all the gold in this world. And you become a trophy of God's grace. This is what a fully functioning church looks like. Are you easy prey? If you won't confess, if you won't allow the Holy Spirit to address the appetites that are in you, then you are. An easy target for Satan. There are footholds that have become strongholds for Satan. A stronghold in your spirit is when you no longer believe it's sin. Like St. Augustine said, you know, my sin was all the more incurable when I did not think myself a sinner. That's a stronghold for Satan. Psalm 33, 5, let's finish what David said in his own acknowledgement. He says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not what? cover up my iniquity. I'm a cracked pot, God. Uh, uh, you didn't make me this way. You made me to be perfect, and I've chosen to give in to the appetites. I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to blame my parents. I'm not going to blame my culture. I'm not going to blame my circumstances. I, I have responded in ways that I thought were best for me, but now I realize they weren't. I've given in to things often enough that now they define me, what was once a one-off is now a habit, and I need help 
breaking that cycle of Satan. So he says, I will what? Confess my transgression. This is your law. I agree it's good. I've crossed the line. I'm coming back. What's that old song? I'm coming back to the heart of worship, Matt Redman. Every church needs to do that. It's all about Jesus. If you've made it all about you, all about your rationalization and justification for whatever reason, for whatever sin, and you stand where St. Augustine was, and you're incurable. You see, I will confess my transgressions. It's far more than catharsis, getting the ick out, and you will forgive me of what? The guilt of my sin, guilt has a ridiculous weight in the human soul. It'll drag you all the way to hell for eternity. Guilt is that emotional discomfort you feel when you're responsible for something that offended or hurt someone else. Most of us think about it this way, but there is a guilt between us and God. Depression, poor self-esteem, broken relationships are the result of choosing to live with your guilt instead of allowing the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary to erase it. As far as the east is from the west, so far. Read it with me. It's right here. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Satan says you're broken. Hide your past. Live with your guilt. Jesus says we can fix that. Confess. Repent. Trust. I want you to walk away with that today. Those three words. Are you ready? Confess. Repent. Trust God you're right. I'm wrong and I don't want to be wrong anymore. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to trust that the work you began in me, you will see through to completion. You don't struggle alone. Let this, cr this church in growing measure as we become more serious about what James has said about a dead faith. Let this church, let Christ help you overcome your past as well as ensure your future. 1 John 1, 9, our last verse together, read it. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. Don't you want to have a clean soul? Folks, this is the only way it works in Jesus. You remember the old song? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. So if you think you've got a happiness in Jesus and you don't trust him, if you think you've got happiness in Jesus and you won't obey him, you're whistling in the dark. And I want you to sing in the daylight. Those who have ears to hear, listen. Amen. So let's... Uh, Pray right now. If you have your eraser, just put it in your hand. And if you don't have your eraser, just pretend you do, okay? Uh, an eraser is simply proof that, you know, mistakes happen. How many of you believe mistakes happen? I do. You know, that's why I love this eraser. You know, when they give you a pencil that's this long and has an eraser that long, <laughs> they don't know who I am. <laughs> but the guy who made this has a pretty good idea how often I screw up, Okay. So uh, whether you put this on the shelf or whatever, whether, uh, and again, uh, we just stamped these last night, so it'll take about two days for that ink to truly fix on these erasers. Um, so you can rub it off right now, but that would kind of defeat the purpose. <laughs> but whenever you look at this eraser, wherever you put it, remind yourself that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed the sin that you've confessed. And in that void, the Holy Spirit will put the pieces back together Cover it with the blood of Jesus Christ, and you will be a trophy of God's grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand and join us in our closing hymn, which is something? Change my heart. Yes.
the stature, the power, any of the attributes of God found in Jesus Christ. He's nothing more than a fallen angel, but he is real. And he's been fighting against the soul of humanity for longer than any of us in this room have been alive. Don't be, don't be alone. Don't be wounded and pull away from the power and the grace of God and Jesus Christ revealed in his church. Help me create a ministry that defines this church. Why would they miss Roseland Church? Because that's where I found Jesus. Because that's where I took my mask off. And I found acceptance. And I found healing. And I found a strength that I didn't know I possessed. I'm excited about what God is doing here. And I hope you will share that excitement with everyone you know. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, amen. amen. Don't forget, Celebrate Recovery is at the Parsonage today at 4 o'clock. So, you know, if you haven't been before and you just want to come for a burger or a brat, there you go. <laughs> See you Thursday.